Let's take your Bibles, please, and turn to the book of Luke, Luke chapter 1, Luke chapter 1. As I looked around the crowd today, I saw a number of our folks are still traveling and out of town, but I saw many guests that filled in, but also I saw a lot of familiar faces. And so if I didn't start mentioning names or mention your name, it's because I would forget somebody, so forgive me. But uh, so good to see you and some of you traveling in from around uh, to be back with us today. We're so thankful for that. And uh, I am tasked now with the duty of moving us from that big bountiful table of thanksgiving uh, to the gifts that we give each other for Christmas. Uh, it reminds us of the Lord Jesus Christ, that eternal gift of eternal life that was given to us. How many are you glad you're saved today? Say amen. amen. Now, boy, don't go droopy. As I, I, I'm, I'm feeling now, I'm thinking right now that the after effects of this chemical that's in Turkey is still affecting you. Whatever that is that makes you sleepy, don't go there. I'll have to holler and scream and jump up and down and gargle peanut butter to get your attention which I've never done, and so don't do that today, but uh, I hope that you had time with family and had an enjoyable time. We did, and we did have a bountiful table. My sister has a way of doing that, makes it look like the first Thanksgiving. Somebody sent me a picture the other day. Uh, uh, it was really a, a, a picture from the first Thanksgiving. It had a big old long bountiful table and the Indians were on one side and the pilgrims on the other and they were serving in and out burger and fries. <laughs> what a picture. Glory to God. Uh, if you've never had an in and out burger, don't come and tell me five guys takes the place of that. It doesn't. How many of you ever, ever had an in and out burger animal style? Animal style. Oh, come on, man. That is the only way to do it. So you won't have to go to California for long because they're moving to Tennessee. <laughs> Instead of loading up the truck and they move to California, the Beverly Hill Village, uh, they, they're loading up the truck with in and out and they're moving to Tennessee. How many thank God for that? See, I'm saying these things now to wake some of you up right now. And uh, that's probably the last thing we need is a triple or a double, what do they call it? A double, double animal animal style fries. Glory to God. Let's stand together, please. Now that we're hungry, I'll have to preach fast. But I'm, I'm tasked with moving us now from Thanksgiving into that holiday spirit. And uh, boy, what a wonderful time. We're going to have a great time on December the 10th. Don't miss it. And uh, moving on into the Christmas time. And there is, uh, I can't describe it, there is a spirit of Christmas. I think that and I fully understand you and I do not worship holidays, observe days for our faith. Coming to church on Christmas doesn't make you a Christian. Can I get that low amen right there? But these are times I believe that God has placed on the calendar, Easter, Thanksgiving, Christmas, and these things that reminds us of special events, like the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ at Easter. And the Thanksgiving that really should be in our hearts all year long. And then the Christmas time. Uh, whenever we get to accent the virgin birth of Jesus Christ and his coming to this earth. In our text today, uh, some of the uh, rumblings of that is going on because we're going to read about John the Baptist. We'll start a series next week, uh, Lord willing. We'll go about three or four weeks on the uh, subject of Christmas. But I want you to look with me, please, at uh, chapter 1. We'll pick up reading in verse number 67. We'll read to the end of the chapter. But um, this, of course, if you catch up real quick, Zacharias was a very elderly priest in the temple. He was still doing his exercises, though they were in 400 silent years, no word from heaven. His wife was Elizabeth, and they're going to have a baby in their old years, and his name is going to be John the Baptist. Zacharias goes, uh, uh, goes uh, speechless for a while, and he begins to speak uh, in verse 67. And his father, Zacharias, was filled with the Holy Ghost and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people, and hath raised up an horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began. By the way, what we're reading has always been prophesied in Scripture. Verse 71 that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all that hate us. And by the way, I'm kind of breaking from the text here somewhat, but all that you see going on with Israel right now and what a horrible thing it is and the war over there, there is coming a day that Israel will look on him whom they have pierced and they'll come to Lord Jesus Christ on that great day of the tribulation 
And what a wonderful day that will be for his, his people, the Jews. But you and I are, have, a, have a Savior we're looking for as well. And you and I have already believed in the Messiah. They have yet to do that. But one of these days they will. And all the enemies and all those that are picking on little Israel right now, I mean, there'll be a payday someday for them. And so we read here in verse 72, to perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he sware to our father Abraham, that he would grant unto us that we being delivered out of the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. And thou, child, shalt be called the prophet of the highest, for thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his way. Speaking of John the Baptist, to give knowledge of salvation to his people by the remission of their sins through the tender mercy of our God, whereby the day spring from, from on high hath visited us to give light to them that sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet in the way of peace. And the child grew and waxed strong in spirit and was in the deserts till the day of his showing <clears throat> unto Israel. <clears throat> By the way, <clears throat> he begins his ministry in chapter 3 of the book of Luke. I'll draw your attention to our text, verse, verse, verse 69. I'd like for you to read it with me together out loud, verse 69, together. Ready? And hath raised up an horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. I want to speak on that for just a while. Speaking of the horn of of our salvation. Father, bless now your word and challenge us today as we begin thinking about this Advent season. And Father, I pray that you'll help us to understand the era that we're living in right now and how John the Baptist had a specific responsibility and how we have a specific responsibility as well. I believe that in the scriptures today, by way of application, that will be understood and help us understand what our job is right now in this day we live in, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. you. may be seated. So most of us have heard of the first advent and this second advent as we move into the Christmas season, Orthodox Christianity will talk, let's talk, <coughs> talk somewhat about the first and second advent. Let me water this windmill here for just a while. First advent, speaking of the time that Jesus Christ came in a miraculous way, the incarnation or the enfleshment of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He was born of the Virgin Mary. Therefore, he did not have Adam's blood coursing through his veins. He had God's blood. Could someone say amen right there? So what a wonderful miracle that was. We call that the first advent, and we'll celebrate that in the days ahead. <clears throat> but then uh, we understand that we have yet to come what is called the second advent of Christ, or the second appearing uh, of Jesus Christ, the first appearing there at the incarnation there in that uh, steel manger, the second advent when Jesus Christ shall come back and set up his throne. It's in two stages. You've heard this, the rapture and the revelation, you and I believe as New Testament Christians that someday the Lord shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead, dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. How many thank God for the rapture of the church? The next thing on God's uh, time uh, table is the rapture of the church. It, it's imminent, meaning it can happen at any moment. But then we're going to have seven years of tribulation. And then we're going to have the return of the Lord, and he's going to set up his kingdom. That revelation of the Lord as he comes back there in the clouds. And what a wonderful day that's going to be. You and I are looking for the rapture. Could you get a little amen right there? But then we're not going to go through that tribulation period, though. Let me just remind you right here, park for just a moment. Everything that you and I are seeing right now in the news is already setting us in gear for what's going to happen in the tribulation period. So let not your heart be troubled. <laughs> Ye believe in God, believe also in me. For in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again. How many thank God for that? And receive unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. Jesus is coming again. 
So John the Baptist comes on the scene as the voice of one crying in the wilderness to bring people to see Messiah and to hear Messiah. And he served his generation well. Though he was a humble man, he was a man that had great responsibility. In one section there in the book of Mark, it tells how all of Israel and Judea came to hear John. And so this man, John the Baptist, as one man described him, was famously known for his off-the-grid, you might say, milk-drinking, honey-eating, traveling through through the wilderness barefoot, making a scene-type lifestyle. He ruffled the feathers of the religious normalcy of his day, confronting the comfortability, this man said, of orthodoxy and protesting societal hierarchy. Those are not my words. Somebody smarter than me said that. This guy was perceived as a very unusual individual. He didn't let anybody stop him from what his job was. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I'm not suggesting that you and I eat locusts and and, uh, all of those things and and, uh, be a maybe off-the-grid type person. Uh, or run around barefoot, <laughs> although I did see a thing the other day about grounding, how we ought to be barefoot. Yeah, get off of that right there. But uh, you and I uh, are living in a John the Baptist point of biblical history and the chronology of it. You and I are living in a generation that's coming down to the end. It is winding down to the end, and you need to be aware of that. Just like in John the Baptist era, as he came on the scene just a few months older than Jesus Christ, he began his ministry actually in chapter 3 as probably about a 30-year-old man, but he only had just a few years before he was actually beheaded by the emperor for his, for his preaching of the gospel. So he only had just a short time to do what he did. Now, I don't know what's holding us up, ladies and gentlemen, but you and I, if the devil knows he has a short time, you and I need to understand that we're living in a culture, we have a short time to get done what we're going to get done. You have to forgive me. I mean, I watch a little bit of football, but I get a little weary seeing full football stadiums and half empty churches. I'm glad we have maybe a church that's kind of outside the norm, and next week we'll, we'll have a full house and a great crowd today. But I'm just saying, now is the time for people to be coming back to the Lord. Maybe I should repeat that. Now is the time for God's people who are out there delinquent and wondering, now is the time for them to be be coming back to the Lord. And that's exactly what John the Baptist's message was. The Israelites had strayed. They had backslidden. In fact, God had judged him just previously with 400 silent years. Nothing from heaven. Heaven was brass. And now out of the clear blue sky, there's just a few years now before Messiah actually begins his earthly ministry. Just a few years, he starts coming and shouting out, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Ladies and gentlemen, that message is just as relevant today as it was in John the Baptist's day. Behold the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, who taketh away the sin of the world. Nobody else can, can, have, can remit our sins except Jesus Christ. So it's a very bold message. And here he comes, out of the wilderness, you might say. Here Zacharias says that God has, has raised up a horn of salvation. What did he mean by that? It's not that John the Baptist was salvation, but he was the horn of salvation, or he was the one going to project that Messiah had come. You and I, and I want to make the analogy very clear as I work my way through this, you and I are not Jesus Christ, and we're not John the Baptist, but you and I are the ones that should be telling others about Jesus Christ. Now, are you following me now? You're, you know, once you get locked into this thing. So he calls uh, this child, or he gives the implication that while after 400 years of nothing, God has raised us up a voice. The word horn is used in a couple of different applications in the Bible. First of all, you had the ram's horn. And the ram's horn was something that could be hollowed out and that they would devise it in such a way that they could make it some type of horn that would project a very loud noise. And a ram's horn was used in different ways. And one of the main ways is to prepare, either to prepare the way of the king or to prepare a way of battle 
or to prepare people to come and gather in at the tabernacle, all three of those are the analogy of what I believe the trump of God's going to do someday. And the king is coming. How many believe that? And so one of the main reasons uh, for the horn, or what we're calling today in the text, the horn of salvation, was a type of not necessarily a musical in- instrument, but a type of alarm, you might say, or a type of announcement. Then you have the horn that symbolized deliverance and salvation. The horns in the scriptures are often used by the prophets of how God's going to take those horns. One prophet did, though he was a false prophet, and, and deliver Israel. And, and uh, so the horn is used often for power and strength and, uh, and deliverance and defense. Another way a horn is used is, is on the horns of the altar. If you would go back to the Old Testament and read, there's actually a, an altar there in the outer court. And on that altar where they'd make the sacrifice, there would be four horns on all four corners. And that, of course, was a, a symbolized the purpose of the sacrifice, but also to, to practically to hold the sacrifice in place. So there was a, the idea of, of how, how there was an orderly way to do things. And there was preparation and order and, and uh, guide for all of it. And so we see here that John the Baptist serves really in all three of those ways. I want you to write three things down very quickly here regarding the horn of our salvation, how you and I should be modern day John the Baptist, if I can say that. Number one, he was a a forerunner to prepare. Would you write that down? He was a forerunner to prepare. I want you to take your Bibles and look at verse number 76. There's all these verses are relevant today, but look at verse 76. The Bible says, Zacharias is prophesying, this child has been born. He's just an infant. And he says this, and thou, child, shalt be called the prophet of the highest, for thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his way. The word Lord there is used speaking of the Messiah. And so John the Baptist would be the one that would go before him, uh, before the Lord Jesus Christ, and prepare the way. He is described again in Luke chapter, look at Luke chapter 3, look at verse number 4. Luke chapter 3, verse 4. Luke 3, verse 4 says this, as is written in the book of the words of Isaiah, that's Isaiah the prophet, saying, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. What does that mean? That means that he is, uh, he's going to be one that's going to be a, a voice crying out in the wilderness. That means his voice is going to be loud because the world is typed as a wilderness. That's very important. You and I need to understand the chronological time slot that we're in in Bible prophecy. Men shall wax worse and worse uh, during their deeds of evil. In the last days, perilous times shall come. Men shall be lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Uh, in the last days, you and I would see wars and rumors of wars. In the last days, crime shall rise. And may I say that even right here in our own little town, crime is on the rise. Whatever happened to quiet little Murfreesboro? You ought to pray for Murfreesboro. You ought to pray for our officers of law that God would protect them. I, I spoke to two of our men. We have three here today that help us uh, with the safety. And I told them today that we pray for them. Now, I'm not, I spoke as your pastor. I hope that you'll be praying for those officers around us. We understand, I strained somewhat here for just a while, but we understand that, that he was uh, preparing the way in the wilderness. He was, uh, he was one crying in the wilderness. The culture in John's day was described as that. You had the Roman Empire. You had the heavy thumb of the Romans uh, on the, especially the people of God, and you thought, well, is there a way out of that? Well, you would think that, man, get saved, get in church, and in, a, in an awful culture like that, you'd have a way out. But th- that was a bust as well. Judaism had so infiltrated the, the, the people of God that they couldn't find the truth, and they're coming out of those dark periods now, and uh, the Pharisees and the scribes and the Sadducees had taken over, and they had made the Word of God oppressive. Not only did, did they have Rome and the world had their thumb on them, but uh, if somebody wanted to be right with God, then over here you had the, the Pharisees and the scribes that would have their weighty laws in addition to the Word of God on them. I would just say that if you were were a God-fearing person in John the Baptist's day, you would feel like there was no way out. 
And ladies and gentlemen, I'll just say this right now. Apart from the real church, a church of the living God, there's no way out in this generation. And if you have a, a, a some of you are visiting today, if you have a Bible-believing, Bible-preaching church somewhere, you ought to be in there. You ought to regularly attend that thing and be faithful. Same way with this church right here. Let's be faithful to the house of God because you and I are living in a wilderness. Wilderness are hard to navigate. It's hard to find a way out. Wilderness are full of evil. Wilderness is full of danger. You don't know what, what lurks behind that, that thicket or what's going to come out after you. I was, I was thinking, uh, uh, you know, today if I, uh, I, if I had to go out and, uh, you know, pitch a tent or I had to maybe uh, uh, live out, out, out in the woods for some reason other than camping, I would certainly want it to be bear proof or whatever proof, wouldn't you? Uh, and uh, I, I just, I, I would want to have some kind of protection in the wilderness because you don't know what lurks out there. A lot of things I'm thinking right now is going through my brain, but understand, as we consider a true wilderness, it's a place where it'd be nice to have somebody to guide you through that. Here came John the Baptist. Behold! The Lamb of God, this world's a mess. The Lamb of God was taking away the sin of the world. Was going to pull us out of this thing. Isaiah said this also in verse, chapter 58, verse 1 of the book of Isaiah. Cry aloud, spare not. Lift up thy voice like a trumpet and show thy people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. I, I want to be as nice and kind as I can be right here. Because, and, I don't, and I realize there's a lot of folks listening right now. We don't need mamby-pamby, feel-good religion right now. And I'm not saying I'm the guy that's going to rock the boat. I am saying, even in your life, your personal life, stop tiptoeing around those that the Lord is leading you to tell about Jesus Christ and to help them along their way. He was a forerunner. You and I, look, we're, we, we are all that this world has right now. I got to hurry. I'll get that in just a moment. Number one, he was a forerunner to prepare. Uh, number two, he was a preacher of the gospel. He was a preacher of the gospel. What, what was one of the things he did? Look at verse 77. To give knowledge of salvation unto his people by the remission of their sins. What was he doing? He was literally giving knowledge or teaching people how to have their sins forgiven. And that was only through Jesus Christ. The one he said that comes after me, he said, I'm not worthy to even loosen his shoe latchet. You may recall that later he goes down into the water and, and all Judea and, 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 and the whole area just kind of came in there at the River Jordan to watch the baptism and, and Jesus stepped down in the water. You may recall that uh, as he baptized him and brought him back up out of the water, which, by the way, newsflash, Jesus wouldn't have got into the water if he was going to be sprinkled. But Jesus went under the water, and when he came back up, a picture of the death, burial, and resurrection, which is why you and I do that. It's identification, not salvation. But when he came up out of the water, the voice from heaven spoke, God spoke from heaven and said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And a dove landed on his shoulder. I mean, everybody there acknowledged that Jesus was God. Wow. Salvation only through that one that John the Baptist pointed to. Our job our responsibility is not just to prepare and be a forerunner, tell folks Christ is coming, but our job is to prepare by telling others the gospel of Jesus Christ. Psalm, excuse me, Matthew 28, 19. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Teach them to observe all things whatsoever I commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the world. So John the Baptist's job was to tell people of the timing that Messiah was coming. Our job is to tell others about the timing of Christ's coming. Don't draw back from that. You need to be a student of the Word of God to understand that. 
But secondly, not just that, but it's our job, just like it was John's job, to be a preacher of the gospel. You say, I am not a preacher. Understand this, the Great Commission is for all of us. Don't miss that. Folks, you need to get to the place where, number one, you can give out the gospel. You understand the death, burial, and resurrection. You know the Bible verses. And you're able to give out the gospel to other people. And then you need to look for the opportunities and pray for the boldness to give out the gospel. I was just talking to a man just this past week. He said that he was out, actually out of town. And uh, he came on a situation where folks were just trying to help some other people out. And he walked up and, and he said, uh, well, are you all Christians? And, and, he, and just out of the clear blue sky, he was telling them about the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, Pastor, all I did, by the way, this man doesn't attend our church. He said, all that I did was give him my testimony. You say, what's a testimony? A testimony is telling somebody else what Christ did for you. One man said it like this, it's one sinner telling another sinner, where he, or one beggar telling another beggar where he can get bread. Do you know that if you're here today and you're born again, all of you have a testimony you can go back and tell. You've heard mine a hundred times. All of you can tell, tell somebody how you got saved. Well, how, how, you, you need to be a Christian. Well, how to become a Christian? Well, here's what I did. All of you can do that. Now, I think that you need to be a little more pronounced and a little more doctrinal about that, but that's a good way to get started. May God help us with that. I'm just saying, a modern-day John the Baptist will be telling other people about Jesus Christ. Here's my last point. He was a teacher of righteousness. He was a teacher of righteousness. Look at verse 79. To give light to them that sit in darkness and in the shadow of death. To guide our feet into a way of peace. Here's what Zacharias said about his boy. He said, here's what my son's going to do. My son is going to give light. He said he's going to shine the light as a guide on people who sit in darkness. He's going to help those who are in the shadow of death. My son, John the Baptist, is coming to be our guide, to guide our feet to the way of peace. And the way of peace is in Jesus Christ, for only in Jesus Christ shall we have peace. And you need to understand this. It is our responsibility, it is our job in our generation to be the light of the path, to guide people out of the darkness that they're in. All around us, you know, we, can, we can set, as one man said, and curse the darkness, or we can light a torch and light the darkness. We can sit all day long, sit around and just, just get real grumpy about how dark it is and how bad it is and how, how unsafe it is and how evil this world is and how could you do this to this person and how could you do this to a, a child and how, and by the way, I ask all the same things. Well, I'm going to tell you how it happens. This is a dark world. It is being ruled right now by the prince of the power of the air that someday God's going to defeat. Until that day happens, you and I are light a match and shine our light. I said something the other day about these little magnesium lighters where you can start a fire without a match or anything like that. I thought that's the coolest thing. I mentioned that, I think, last Sunday. By Monday or Tuesday morning, I had somebody, one of our men brought me one. Coolest thing. He got me one. He must have hit, hit add the card at Amazon and brought her in there. Because in just, a, I mean, just 48 hours, I've got one. I thought, I want to use this. Now, you got to understand, not all, but many of our staff are rednecks. <laughs> our pastoral staff. They like to see things burn and blow up. They just, they're not right. You kind of got to be like that a little bit to do what we do. But anyhow, I want to try it. So it was raining outside and so we all went outside uh, underneath one of those little, little canvas awnings and and I had uh, some tissue paper and so I ground that magnesium off there and and uh, I, I, I tried to light it there and it, it lit for a while and our youth pastor I won't mention his name but Jordan said <laughs> he said come in here come in here so we go inside now and we put some tissue paper down in a coffee cup it was a gift to him from me I said, you sure you want to do this? Yeah, yeah, this would be cool. And so he scraped a bunch of it off, and we hit that thing. Poof. Man, it made just, just in no time. Poof. 
it made this bright light. Now, I don't know why I told you that, other than the fact that you needed to know that we did that. <laughs> but what's it going to take for you to light your light? What's it going to take for the people that surround you to guide them out of the mess that they're in? Do you understand that you have people that you work with and people in your home they're in a mess, they're in a wilderness, and they're just looking for a way out. And you could be their way out. I would just say this to you today. This is how God spoke to my heart. The Lord has raised up in this generation a horn of salvation. Jesus Christ is our salvation, but you're the horn. You're the honker. <laughs> My little granddaughter, I got to tell you this. She, uh, she likes French fries. I'm all about health food today. I don't know how I got on hamburgers and health. But every now and then, I taught her when she pulls out a real big long one. I said, oh, boy, look here, Shuggy. This is a honker. <laughs> so she's with her mom and dad the other day, and she pulled out a French hat. She said, Papa said, this is, this is a honker right here. But you need to understand something. I want you to consider that horn of salvation. You are the one, and you need to consider yourself the person that God has raised up to blow the horn, to announce that there is a Jesus Christ, that he's coming back. You're the one that's going to kind of guide the way for them. You need to understand that you could be the only one in your family's circle that could be the horn of salvation. You could be the only one in your neighborhood that can be the horn of salvation. You could be the only one in your work group that's the horn of salvation. Be the only one on your street or your neighborhood that's the horn of salvation. Zacharias said, I never would have believed it. But just like the prophet said, God has given me and my wife the son that's going to announce the way of the Lord. And every one of us need to look at our position here today in this wilderness that we call life in 2023. God has allowed you to be the person of influence in your people group. Let's stand.